This program is brought to you by Emory University. Our speaker today, Marcelo Fernandez. Marcelo, um, for those that haven't met him, is one of our first year clinical fellows. Uh, he grew up in Clemson, South Carolina, went to Clemson for undergraduate, went to Duke for medical school, and uh, did a residency at University of Miami, where he's a chief resident last year. And as you can see, he will be talking to us today about cardiac amyloidosis. Marcelo. So um, thank you for joining me on what is an ominous day, Friday the 13th, for what I hope is a not so ominous discussion on cardiac amyloid. Um, I have no uh, disclosures. So my, my goal for this morning is to provide a, a comprehensive but contemporary understanding of cardiac amyloid. Uh, and in so doing, uh, I'll discuss the pathophysiology uh, of cardiac amyloid. I will review the utility of multimodality image, imaging with a uh, focus on uh, speckle tracking, um, CMR parametric mapping, and uh, pyrophosphate scanning. And then I will discuss the contemporary and emerging uh, management strategies for both um, uh, AL amyloid as well as uh, TTR. So uh, we'll start with a general understanding of what amyloidosis actually is. So um, essentially, when proteins are translated, their configuration is important because they, the actual structure of the protein not only determines the function of the protein, but it also helps determine the tropism for the different uh, tissues and organs involved, okay? So when there is a misfolding of proteins, usually and traditionally, there are mechanisms by which uh, these proteins are destroyed. Sometimes they are not, and they develop a conformation that is kinetically or thermodynamically favorable. They can then aggregate and then subsequently deposit uh, in different tissues and then cause disease. All right. So when we are thinking about cardiac or we're thinking about amyloid, so amyloid comes in different flavors. Uh, the ones that we most care about uh, as cardiologists uh, are ATTR and uh, AL amyloid. So ATTR amyloidosis is a uh, disease by which a protein, a homotetramer, TTR, uh, which is named by its function, it transports thyroxin and vitamin A, and that protein uh, becomes unstable um, and deposits in, in, uh, in the, the myocardium. Um, and within that, there is a wild type, which is found primarily in older patients. Uh, and there is a variant form that is due to mutations. Uh, nearly 100 of them are known, uh, and they come from various degrees of, of pathology. Some of them are more cardiac, uh, others are more uh, uh, neuropathy in nature, or a variation of both. Uh, and lastly, there's AO amyloid, which is uh, essentially due to a plasma cell dyscrasia. Uh, that can then deposit, deposit in, in the myocardium and lead to a very aggressive disease state. So I've, I've broken up this talk into uh, discussing uh, AL amyloid, uh, the pathophysiology of it, and then ATTR, and then we'll, we'll uh, condense the two uh, to discuss the imaging uh, and then treatment. So starting with uh, AL amyloid, you know, frankly, uh, it's impossible to discuss AO amyloid without at least having a review of, of hematology. So I will keep it on a very elementary level. Uh, so going back to um, sort of medical school, um, our bone marrow is very important um, for uh, the immune system. The bone marrow has the white blood cells, the B cells, which can then transform into plasma cells. These plasma cells uh, uh, comprise less than 5% of the leukocytes in the bone marrow, uh, and, and they secrete antibodies. Antibodies are comprised of heavy chains and light chains. Um, the light chains, there's a kappa, kappa and a lambda chain. And when this process uh, goes ORI, then you can have a plasma cell dyscrasia, okay? So essentially, uh, three main things can happen with plasma cell dyscrasia, all right? So issue number one, all right? So if, if the plasma cells uh, develop a clonal cell, 
okay? And they comprise less than 10% of, of the cells in the bone marrow and produce excess light chains, not a lot, just excess light chains, you, without any evidence of, of bone or organ involvement, that's MGUS, okay? So if you have then unregulated production and you take over, let's say 20 to 30 percent of the bone marrow, all right, uh, and you have other disease findings such as uh, bone fractures, et cetera, uh, that's multiple myeloma. And actually it's multiple myeloma because these, uh, the, the tumor forms multiple areas of, of bone involvement, so that's why it's called multiple myeloma. Um, Lastly, you can get a situation in which these light cells are produced uh, that then have a proclivity for misfolding, uh, and then they can uh, they have tropism for different organs, uh, including the heart, and they and that's when you have uh, AL uh, amyloidosis, and if it involves the heart, certainly it's, it's cardiac AL amyloidosis. All right, so initially, sort of the thought in terms of the pathogenesis was. You have these depositions of these misfolded uh, um, proteins, the amyloids, and then they de deposit in the myocardium, and that leads to a process by which there is diastolic dysfunction, uh, a progressive heart failure, uh, and then ultimately death, okay? But uh, more recently, there is a greater understanding of the pathophysiology, and the story um, doesn't stop here. Okay, so the light chains we know now in and of themselves uh, can lead or actually have a cardiotoxicity effect uh, that has been borne out by several different studies. So this, this study was published um, by Dr. Liao, uh, who was originally at Boston University and is now at the Amyloid Stan Center in Stanford. Uh, and what, what, what Dr. Lau's group did is essentially they purified light chains from patients with uh, cardiac involvement. Uh, they also purified light chains from a control group and then from, from uh, patients who uh, don't have AL amyloid, let's say they have multiple myeloma actually in this case. And they used a mouse model. Uh, they injected these, uh, these light chains into the mouse model, um, and then they tracked uh, the, the LVEDP. And what they found is that uh, with the injection of the, of the light chains from patients uh, who have um, uh, cardiac involvement in a setting of AL amyloidosis, the LVEDP went up significantly at a much faster rate. And I don't have a photo here of, of the other graph, but essentially when these light chains were removed, the EDP came down, suggesting that there is a, an actual toxicity effect of these light chains on the myocardium. This was subsequently followed up with an additional study using zebrafish uh, model, uh, which they also uh, gave purified light chains to zebrafish, uh, and they were able to uh, assess the cardiac function. And what we see here is that uh, parameters such as choke volume, uh, cardiac, out cardiac output, uh, also uh, decreased compared to control groups. And when you look at the survival curve, uh, the zebrafish died uh, very quickly. They had a median survival of five days post-injection, and by 13 days, all of them had died. Now, I don't know what the average lifespan is of a zebrafish, but um, you can just look at this curve and know that it's, uh, uh, this isn't good, right? They're dying rather quickly. Uh, and what we also know about amyloid is that the um, AO amyloid can also cause microvascular dys dysfunction. Um, this was a study where um, they essentially took samples from adipose tissues and then from atrial tissues in patients undergoing cardiac surgery for other reasons. Um, they wanted to induce or attempted to reduce basal reactivity with bradykinin. And what you can see is that uh, among the, light, uh, the patients who had the light chains from AO amyloid, um, um, there was less basal reactivity, suggesting that there is also a microvascular component. And actually, if you look at the literature, you can see that there are uh, numerous uh, case reports of patients who present who have um, AO amyloid and present with chest pain and not necessarily the classic sort of heart failure symptoms. Okay, so um, we'll now transition to uh, talking about uh, ATTR. 
So ATTR, as I alluded to before, um, comes in two different flavors. There's a wild type, there's a variant. The wild type is essentially uh, the, the normal proteins, essentially this homo tetramer form, um, develops a conformational state uh, such that uh, they are deposited in the myocardium and they cause disease. Unlike AL amyloid, there's not a lot of extra cardiac manifestations of TTR uh, wild type. It's a mostly a cardiac disease. Patients can have some carpal tunnel, but that's essentially mostly the extent of it. Okay, um, the sort of understanding for why this happens is a seemingly normal protein, this normal homotetramer, why, why this leads to uh, a state such that it causes disease is a little bit unknown. But there is some, some thought that maybe uh, oxidative modification uh, issues, uh, which happens most often in older patients, which then would explain this, um, this finding in mostly older patients. Um, maybe some post-protein binding with chaperone proteins or post-translational modifications. These are all, all sort of thoughts and theories that have yet to be fully teased out uh, in, in initial studies. So just some features. Uh, the male to female ratio is 20 to 1. Like I said, most patients are older. Uh, it's a Caucasian predominant uh, disease. Um, and as I said, heart is the only uh, major organ to be cl uh, clinically involved. Uh, some post-mortem studies have found that you can have wild-type deposition in the lung and the liver, but these don't necessarily confer any clinical findings um, outside of, of, of sort of these depositions. Um, so the wild type was uh, previously thought to be rather rare, um, but more recently with, with post-mortem studies and also with the advent of new, newer sort of more efficient diagnostic modalities, including PYP scan, what we've been able to understand is that perhaps the disease is, is found, is prevalent in up to 10 to 25 percent of patients with, uh, with HEF-PEF. Right, so there was an initial study in 1983 that looked at uh, uh, a post-mortem study. This is a study out of uh, France, the French group. Um, this is a study out of the Mayo Clinic, and then uh, most recently they've used PYP scanning to try to get a better assessment of the prevalence of, of disease. Um, this is survival curve from a paper that was published in circulation in 2016 uh, from Dr. Connors out of Boston University, who worked with Rick Ruberg and, and the other folks there. Um, and they essentially followed 121 patients with biopsy proven uh, wild type, ATTR wild type, and, and followed them for 20 years. Um, and the average or the median survival from the time of biopsy diagnosis was 46. Uh, 0.69 months. So essentially, this is a, an indolent disease, uh, like AO amyloid, where the median survival without treatment is six months. This takes time, although amyloid deposition can can develop um, rather robustly. It's a it's a disease process by which it takes it takes some years uh, uh, to really uh, confer worsening prognosis. So now we're going to transition to the variant form of ATTR. So this is an autosomal, autosomal dominant uh, condition. It has a variable penetrance. Um, the ATTR variant, we know, like I said, there's about 100 uh, known mutations. And what essentially happens is the homo tetramer exists in a balance with, mon with a monomeric form when a um, for whatever reason, and, and we sort of, it ties back to these mutations, these point mutations, they develop a kinetically favorable state. They then aggregate and deposit in tissues, okay? Um, there's variable organ tropism, which is evident in a phenotype. So, so you can have patients who have a certain uh, mutation that then confers a more cardiac phenotype. There are some that are more variable, uh, and, and then there's others that are strictly most uh, uh, polyneuropathy, and we refer to those as FAP. So this is a, uh, a schematic representation of what I just mentioned uh, with the different uh, genotype and the mutations. Um, and it, this is on a spectrum. And um, the two uh, mutations that we most 
are interested in or the sort of is most relevant to us is the uh, uh, V1, 22 ILE mutation and the V30 MET. Okay, so the, the, the VAL30 MET um, is the most common mutation uh, worldwide. Uh, it is more uh, of a polyneuropathy, has very little cardiac involvement. Among patients who do have cardiac involvement, they may display some conduct, some conduction problems, um, some AV nodal dysfunction, but no, nothing um, very severe. The, we know that there are endemic areas, so Portugal, Brazil, Japan, and Sweden. Um, and I just want to take an aside, and if you'll indulge me for two minutes. Uh, so I, I really like history, and I, I studied history when I was in college. And so when you look at this endemic areas, you may think, well, that's kind of odd, right? Like, well, why is Portugal and Brazil, Japan, and Sweden, why is it endemic in those areas? That, I mean, it's not even, they're not even close to one another. But there's actually a reason, and I'll, I'll try to explain this to you. So Brazil is obviously uh, was colonized by Portugal, okay? And uh, essentially, in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, Brazil was very, uh, still a very rural country, very big, but very rural, all right? And Brazil at the time had a lot of coffee fields. Around the same time, the Japanese were looking for areas for places to work. They heard about sort of these coffee fields in Brazil, and they migrated to Brazil. And as a matter of fact, Brazil holds the largest population of Japanese people outside of Japan, right? There's about two million people uh, who are Japanese who live, in, who live in Brazil, which is bigger than, much larger than, say, Seattle, which is the second largest outside of Japan. Um, and as far as Sweden, well, I, you know, this, this Japanese migration to Brazil happened in the early 1900s until about 1915. Around the same time, there was something called a Great Nordic Migration, where people from Finland and Sweden and other Scandinavian countries migrated. Uh, and during this time, from late 1800s, 1890 to about 1915, 1917, 90 percent of Swedes migrated to Brazil. So it does sort of explain maybe this perfect storm, if you will, uh, why this uh, genetic mutation is particularly prevalent in these areas. The other mutation that we worry about, particularly here in the United States, is the VAL122 ILE. So this is the most common mutation in the United States. It's mostly uh, it's actually prevalent in the African American population. These patients um, develop heart failure at a very at a younger age than the, the wild type group, uh, and they are most never associated with uh, neuropathy other than carpal tunnel, specifically bilateral carpal tunnel. All right, this is the Theos registry that uh, shows a pie chart of what I described. So in the rest of the world, the VAL 30M is the most uh, prevalent mutation in the United States. If you're looking at, at uh, ATTR in general, certainly wild type is more common, but then um, right after that is the VAL 122 ILE. So how do these patients present, right? So we understand the pathophysiology, and with that backdrop, let's, let's translate that to the bedside. So um, the, in terms of AO amyloid, there is systemic amyloid deposition. So patients then have a variety of, of findings. They can have macroglossia, um, um, periorbital purpura, which, by the way, is very specific for AO amyloidosis. Probably is, is, I think it's actually pathognomonic for that disease. Um, you can have uh, thin or wasting, um, et cetera. When, when thinking about cardiac features of amyloid, uh, and this is, pertains to both AL and ATTR, uh, they develop this cardiomyopathy, which starts off as um, diastolic dysfunction as the disease progresses. You have restrictive physiology, and certainly as the disease progresses even more, you have systolic dysfunction. The conduction abnormalities include uh, various degrees of AV block, um, a lot of these patients have uh, um, prolonged, uh, a lot of them have first degree AV blocks with, with very long PR intervals. There is a pseudo-infarct pattern on the ECG, 
Um, and lab findings, these patients will have troponin elevations, anti-pro-B and P elevations. And with AL amyloid, these pro-B and P ele elevations are, are actually very marked uh, in, into the thousands. And the pro-B and P in the troponin in terms of AL amyloid is actually used for a, a staging system, which I won't get into, but uh, just something to be aware of. This is a classic ECG. As you can see, there's this pseudo-infarct pattern uh, uh, in the anterior septum. So there's this QS pattern in V1 and V3. There is a uh, low voltage and the limb bleeds. So there's poor R wave progression. Again, all of these things are suggestive of, of cardiac amyloid. So now uh, we'll talk about multimodality imaging. So, we ha so now you have a patient who displays these clinical manifestations, who has these, this history. Um, and, and it's EKG finding. So you're not just gonna sit on it, you're gonna investigate it further, okay? And there are different ways to further investigate this. So we'll start with echocardiogram. All right, so the echocardiogram findings are kind of what you would expect in an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. So these patients who have preserved or, or near no, or normal or near normal EF, uh, there is uh, a pretty pronounced uh, wall thickness, um, which is disproportionate to the voltage on the ECG. So if you have a very thick myocardium and you think it's from you know, hypertension, if you will, you would expect to see increased voltages on, on, on the uh, 12 lead, but we don't see that um, um, with amyloid. And, and really the reason for that is because we say LVH, but it's not really LVH, right? Uh, it's the, the, the cells don't necessarily get, get bigger, bigger. It's mostly due to the amyloid deposition that causes this, this imaging finding of a thick myocardium. So that's why we don't really see these voltages um, increase uh, on the ECG. Though I will say that if you compare to AO amyloid, AO amyloid ATTR, there's a more pronounced um, decreased voltages, voltages on the AO amyloid compared to ATTR. Uh, there's also bioatrial enlargement, there's this uh, echogenicity sort of finding. Um, and on tissue Doppler, you can have restrictive uh, physiology as the disease progresses. All right, so here's an example. Uh, you can obviously appreciate the, uh, the, the thick myocardium. There is a um, pericardial fusion, which a lot of these patients may have. The, the uh, valves, uh, leaflets may also be thickened. Um, and you have a, uh, a tissue Doppler um, a pattern that is consistent with diastolic dysfunction and, as I said, can eventually develop into a restricted physiology. But it's also important to know that echo cannot differentiate between amyloid type. So a lot of these findings are consistent across all the different kinds of cardiac amyloid, and it's very hard to discern. Not, it's not necessarily very hard. It's impossible to discern between the different types, okay? And not only that, it's hard to differentiate between different types, but it's also hard to differentiate between other causes of, of, hypertrophy, of, of hypertrophy. So these may all look similarly, similar, but they're, they're different etiologies of, of uh, disease. So there is something that, that is uh, now more sort of uh, often used in these cases, and we use this to, to differentiate uh, different causes of, of uh, hypertrophy. Um, so we all know that this can be used, and it's most often used in, in patients who, who have, uh, are undergoing chemotherapy uh, to look for longitudinal strain. So speckle tracking. Um, so, so here uh, you see the, the, the strain curve, right? So you have aortic valve closure. These lines confer or rather are uh, related to the different areas of segments here uh, of, of the myocardium. This is peak strain, okay, uh, which you see uh, in the apex. And then as the curve uh, sort of decreases or, or is, is not as pronounced, that's uh, decreased strain. So you see this most, uh, most pronounced, this decreased uh, strain uh, in the basal areas, um, which is uh, uh, suggestive of, of, of cardiac amyloid. And if you were to take this into a polar map, you have this uh, cherry on top appearance, appearance with apical sparing uh, on, on strain. But echo is only one piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, 
So the even with with speckle tracking, there's a lot of vendor uh, variability. Um, you know, how can you sort of interpret or contextualize these variations in age to specific values? Is it really due to a pathology or is it due to the normal effects of aging? Um, speckle tracking obviously depends on actually seeing and having speckles. So um, uh, you also need to define these sub endocardial borders. All of these things uh, make, make it challenging. Um, and according to sort of contemporary data, the, what we sort of see as the bullseye, uh, bullseye pattern, the cherry on top pattern, is, is uh, actually 37.5%. There was an, a paper that was originally published that said that, that this, this cherry on top could identify um, uh, patients with uh, amyloid with a 92% sensitivity, uh, sensitivity, 93% specificity. We now know that's actually much lower. So about 37.5%, okay? So uh, what are some other imaging uh, modalities that we can use that we can uh, get from um, our uh, armamentorium? Uh, and one of that is, is CMR. So the CMR, we can look for late Galilean enhancement, and more, more recently, there's been uh, increased interest in parametric mapping. So I know it's too early in the morning to talk about physics, but, but I just want to um, discuss a few things because, it, it, frankly, it's just you're not going to understand this uh, very well if you don't understand MRI physics, okay? So our body is made up of 70% water. MRI takes advantage of hydrogen uh, atoms, uh, protons, to generate an image. There are four important concepts that I, that I want you all to keep in mind. All right, so we'll go through them uh, in the next few slides. So concept number one is a concept of nuclear spin, okay? So protons spin, I mean, they, they don't actually really spin, but, okay, but we'll, we'll say that it's spinning, okay? When protons spin, they generate a small magnetic field. Okay, this is called a magnetic moment, all right? Magnetic moments uh, essentially align the proton in a particular direction, all right? Protons, and this is also based on their energy state. There's a property in quantum, in quantum physics called Pauli exclusion principle that basically states that no two fermions can exist in the same quantum state, okay? This is important because our hydrogen atoms are randomly moving around in our body. They're not lined up, which is why we're not walking around like magnets, okay? Because if they were lined up, we'd probably be magnets, all right? So uh, concept one, protons spin. They generate a magnetic field, which is called a magnetic moment in our bodies. These protons are randomly moving around. All right, got it. Concept two. Well, what happens when you go inside an MRI machine? Well, there are two things that occur, all right? Alignment and precession. So the MRI machine has a coil. It's cooled by, so it's cooled, uh, and it generates a magnetic field. When you generate a magnetic field, the protons line up longitudinally, either parallel to the magnetic field or anti-parallel to the magnetic field. All right, not only do they line up, but they wobble. Okay, they wobble about an axis. This is called precession. So they kind of go like, sort of like this. If you're watching it from afar, I just wobbled, but that's neither here nor there. All right, so here it is. So it's wobbling about an axis, all right? So when you have the, so now, and, and this wobbling business is important. Now you may say, well, who cares, right? Well, we should care because we can calculate the frequency by which this wobbling happens. And if you calculate this frequency, the frequency turns out that it's within the range of what we deem is radio frequency. All right, this is gonna be important. Stay with me, this is gonna be important. All right, so this is radio frequency. And it's calculated by uh, Lamour's equation, so it's a Lamour's frequency. All right, so. If we, so now we can give a second pulse. If we just said that this is, uh, this frequency is a radio frequency. So we can give radio frequency, okay? When you give radio frequency to an atom that is 
equal to the Lamore frequency, that atom absorbs the frequency. So let me give you an example. Let's say, so today is Friday, all right? So Friday evening, you sit around, you grab a glass of wine, all right? And then you hit it, and it produces this lovely note, and you're like, well, that's really nice. Okay, fine. But let's say that it emits uh, this note at a frequency of 250 hertz, okay? If you hit it at the exact same frequency as that glass, Lamore's frequency, you're gonna shatter that glass. And it has nothing to do with sound nothing to do with sound, it has to do with this quantum physics property of, of uh, uh, Lamore frequency, okay, all right, and, and, and resonance specifically. So we use this in MRI because we can give a radio frequency pulse equal to the Lamore frequency of hydrogen atoms and we knock down the magnetic field. So instead of these protons being lined up longitudinally, Boom, now they're lined up on a different axis, 90 degrees perpendicular to the longitudinal plane. All right. Concept number four, last concept. Last concept. We can take away the radio frequency poles and the protons can relax. So when you, when you take down the magnetic field and they're lined up, long, they're lined up perpendicular, perpendicularly, okay, they go from a low energy state to a high energy state. You take away the radio frequency pulse, they emit energy. Now, law of conservation of energy says we don't lose energy. That energy is harnessed to form an image. This is MRI, okay? This is what happens in MRI. And we can calculate the degree by which we get a signal back, the intensity of a signal. And by a mathematical equation, that, that cutoff is 63%. So, so how long it takes, the rate in which this, the, the MRI machine observes or gets back 63% intensity of the signal, all right? Each tissue has different properties. So in tissues that are dense in protons, that relaxation is gonna happen much quicker. And when this happens more quickly, you're gonna get a bright image on your, on, your, on your image, right? So that's why fat, for example, is very bright on an MRI, as opposed to blood, it's dark. Because blood, there's fewer hydrogen atoms, it takes longer for the relaxation to occur, and for the MRI machine, for the RF coils, to sense that return energy, that's why it's dark. So when we say T1-weighted images, what we refer to is, the time in which it takes for relaxation to occur is to sense relaxation in the form of energy. All right, now we understand MRI. Okay, which takes us to late gallium enhancement. All right, we use late gallium enhancement because we want to observe certain patterns. Traditionally, this was used to, to differentiate between ischemic and non-ischemic cardiac myopathy. We now know that there are certain disease states, different, different cardiac myopathies, that then sort of um, cause different patterns on, on uh, this late gadolinium enhancement, okay? So the gadolinium is injected, it, it goes into the interstitium. The interstitium is, is usually very small, 20 to 25%. Uh, it increases the interstitium, it binds to the amyloid, okay? When it binds to the amyloid, it increases the density of the protons. This is why it lights up. This is what happens, okay? So we give it, we wait about five minutes, we look at an image, it lights up, okay? And it lightens up in a classic pattern, all right? So there's the early in the disease, there's a subendocardial pattern, as the disease progresses, this enhancement can become transmural. Importantly, it does not follow coronary territory, uh, which is how you know it's not an ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the sensitivity is 85 to 90 percent. It's very hard to know the specificity of these things because you're only going to, so, so for you to know the specificity, you have to correlate it with, with histopathology. You're only going to correlate it if your MRI is positive, right? So it's hard. All right. Additionally, this enhancement pattern, although it sort of has these classic findings, can have multiple patterns, and it's still amyloid. And so that makes it as hard, okay? For you to 
get a late gadolinium enhancement pattern, you have to know the myocardium. Okay, this is done with a specific sequence. All right. Um, and so on the bottom, on the bottom right here, you see this in a purpley known myocardium. Uh, there is something called a TI scout sequence, also called look locker sequence, which you see here. What happens? You take the images, you find the 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 sequence with the inversion time that knows the myocardium and allows you to see the late gadolinium enhancement. Okay. This can be tedious, it can also be difficult, um, and this is why late gallium enhancement is not 100% um, sensitive and, and it's prone to errors. Which takes us to CMR parametric mapping. So this is fancy, but it's rather simple now that we understand how uh, MRI works. So this is basically a way to characterize tissue without biopsy, right? So before we said that, for example, T1 weighted images, you, acquire, you, you see images based on the intensity of a signal, the intensity of the relaxation that is the dentist signal. Now we're quantifying that signal in time, in milliseconds. How fast do we get the signal? This is the concept of T1 mapping, all right? And we can get these nice, pretty images as a result. So T1 mapping, so this is a time constant representing the recovery of the longitudinal magnetization, so this is spin lattice relaxation. This is when you give the RF frequency pulse, you take it out, it relaxes, all right, it's spin lattice relaxation. Native T1, when we say native T1, this is, native, this is T1 in the absence of an exogenous contrast agent, you got a linium, okay? And um, like I said, it, it, it relates to the, to the intrinsic tissue properties. It's useful for characterizing diffuse infiltrated myocardial disease uh, non-invasively. Um, the normal T1 value, so that the normal times, really depends on several different things, including sequence. So there is a modified book locker sequence called MOLLY. There's different ones called SHMOLLY, et cetera. So that, so the sensitivity specificity will, will, will depend on, on those sequences. So I, I spent a lot of time um, putting together this, this math representation of, of T1 mapping, okay? Uh, I'm gonna make this really simple, all right? So here's what happens. You acquire these images, okay, based on inversion times, okay? So basically, you give the pulse, the protons go 90, 180 degrees, you take away the pulse, they start relaxing, you start taking photos, all right? After you start taking images, in this, in this sequence, this is, this is a sequence for a modified look lock, or Molly sequence. You wait three beats, you take three additional images. You then line this up into an inversion time, okay, and based on the inversion time, okay? You fit this curve based on an equation. So this is an exponential equation where, where uh, E equals a Euler's number. Okay, so this is based on the natural log. You fit it into a you fit it into a pixel and you get these images. Okay, this is what happens. All right, and the software does this, but this is the concept. And you then take your cursor on your computer and you circle a region of interest. Once that happens, the machine will give you a time in milliseconds. You will have a, a reference on the side and you will know what the normal values are and that characterizes the tissue. So fibrosis, maybe if it's amyloid, for example, all right, has a very long one T1 in milliseconds, around 1100, as opposed to something like maybe myocarditis or sarcoid, which is lower. So now instead of just looking at late gallium enhancement, knowing that fibrosis is, is present, and then just having to rely on a pattern, you can actually quantify these values. Each tissue in disease state has a specific millisecond range, and you can then use it as a more objective, more accurate, quantifiable measure of disease. Okay, this is a paper that gives you some of the uh, normal reference values based on the, on the sequence. Okay, so some, some uh, so biological determinants of native T1, so things that increase the native T1, so edema, uh, the increase in interstitial space, so fibrosis, et cetera. Factors that decrease are things like iron overload, uh, 
uh, lipid overload in which you see in Fabre's disease, et cetera. Okay, the other concept is extracellular volume fraction. This is very easy. So when the gadolinium, so, so T1, okay, you are me measured intracellular and extracellular uh, um, time, all right? Gadolinium goes to the extracellular space in the interstitium. So you can actually quantify the amount of gadolinium within that space. This is called ECV. You put it into this equation, a very high ECV above 0.4 or 40% is amyloid, okay? So pre-contrast to one map, don't give a contrast. You give the contrast, so these are regions of interest, it gives you a time, all right? Then you wait a little bit and you calculate the ECV. So there's an ECV map, you put your region of interest, it gives you a percentage or a ratio, all right? And it's based on this equation. You, importantly, you have to get a hematocrit, okay? You have, to, you have to know what the hematocrit is to, to calculate this. These are just the published uh, T1 mapping and ECV. So amyloid is right here. So like I said, uh, native T1 values are high. ECV is high. Um, above 40 is amyloid. So uh, between 10, 15, 11, 50 is also suggest amyloid. All right. So, so what happens with, with CMR, just, so, just to, for you to complete your, your study, so you, you get CNE images, or this is uh, the, the, the stack, the CNE stack here, okay? You see here, very thick myocardium. Uh, and then you give the late gadolinium enhancement, or you look for that pattern. You compare it to your, your uh, parametric mapping, the, the native T1 that gives you milliseconds, and the ECV that gives you the percentage of gadolinium in the interstitial space. These all can be used together to then point to amyloid, all right? This is, so this is what parametric mapping means, okay? All right, now the assessing the true sensitivity and specificity is difficult, this is why it's not readily established and it doesn't ob obviate the need for a biopsy, for example, right? You can't really tell the difference between TTR and AO amyloid. A lot of these studies are uh, single center studies, um, and so, uh, CMR does not establish a diagnosis and cannot differentiate between different types of amyloid. Okay, we're now going to go to ready nuclide imaging. You can diagnose ATTR without biopsy based solely on a pyrophosphate scan. Pyrophosphate scan has been around for a while, since the 80s. It used to be used for uh, assessing, uh, uh, diagnosing myocardial infarctions, okay? More recently, we have taken the advantage of pyrophosphate, which binds to the bone. It's a bone avid uh, compound, and we use it to, Im to image the, the myocardium. What we know is that TTR amyloid uh, takes up the, the pyrophosphate, the pyrophosphate, uh, uh, very readily, okay? DPD and HMDP are found in Europe, PYP is in the United States, but they're like, they're basically the same thing. Um, so ATR cardiac amyloid has an affinity for, for bone radio tracers. Um, AL amyloid does not take up pyrophosphate. So this is why you can differentiate between the two, okay? There is a classic paper that was published in 2016 uh, out of Columbia by Dr. Bukhari. Uh, and in patients in which you get a free light chain and it's negative, so you're not, you don't have a, a plasma cell dyscrasia, you've ruled it out, okay? You know amyloid is present, you've ruled out plasma cell dyscrasia, you subject these patients to a POIP scan, you can identify or diagnose amyloid, TTR, ATTR, uh, with 100% sensitivity and 86% specificity. You do not need to do a biopsy in these cases, all right? So these are the diagnostic parameters, which I will show you an example. Basically, you give a pyrophosphate, technician pyrophosphate, you wait an hour, you get something called a heart to contralateral long ratio. If at one hour it's 1.5 or higher, you're, you stop, you're done, it's over. Okay, you got a diagnosis, okay? However, sometimes because of, of, of uh, blood pooling, it may be difficult to really get this number. So you need transaxial images, and you do that with SPECT. Okay, so at three hours, you get specced uh, uh, images as well, and you calculate a heart-to-bone ratio, all right? And I'll show you an example. So here's what happens. 
So, so after an hour, you give the pyrophosphate, you draw a region of interest, okay? You find the myocardium, you draw a region of interest, you go to the contralateral lung, make sure you're not getting a diaphragm or the sternum because that's gonna mess up your values, okay? The computer is gonna, is gonna give you this ratio. It's gonna give you several different ratios of tracer. You want the mean, the mean tracer, okay, the mean. And then you get this at one hour, it's 1.9. This is normal, okay? So it's region of interest, region of interest, it's normal. This is not ATTR. This is, all right. If there's blood pooling or if you're not getting good images or if there's uh, diaphragm is, is messing up the images, et cetera, then it's hard to do this. So you look at the transaxial images and instead of getting uh, a ratio, you get a grade. All right, and the grade is based on the relative uptake, the, the uptake of the, of the myocardium relative to the bone, okay? So and I'll go back here. On, so a grade zero, no my, myocardial uptake, normal bone uptake. Grade one, myocardial uptake less than a rib. Grade two, myocardial uptake equal to the rib, and then myocardial uptake uh, greater than rib is three. If you have a grade of two or three, you have a diagnosis, got it? After you get the diagnosis, you need genotyping because it just tells you that you have ATTR. It doesn't tell you whether it's a variant or wild type, so you have to, so you have to genotype these patients, okay? All right, so let's, let's sort of synthesize all of this and condense it into a uh, uh, diagnostic framework. So you have a situation in a, in a patient that has these sort of physical manifestation, these clinical findings, you get imaging, be it echo, MRI, et cetera. These all suggest that you have uh, amyloid. Um, and, and then so the next thing that you wanna do is you wanna ask yourself, is there an underlying plasma cell dyscrasia? So you, you have to get labs, okay? Before you go down this, this rabbit hole, you have to get some labs. The labs that you wanna get are the troponin, the anti-pro NT, BMP, and then importantly, okay, it's not SPEP and UPEP, you wanna get free light chains, and you want to get uh, um, uh, immunofixation, all right, serum uh, uh, in urine. So if the, if the answer is no, you get a pyrophosphate scan because you, you can't really be AO amyloid. I mean, there's some cases, there's some false positives AO amyloid, but don't worry about that. Just do your pyrophosphate scan, okay? If it's positive, you're done, all right? So all you need to do is get a genotype, okay? If it's negative, it's unlikely that it's cardiac amyloid, okay? If you have a plasma cell dyscrasia, you need to actually get a biopsy, all right? So, uh, and then you have to identify the, the actual uh, protein. You do this by uh, mass spec, et cetera. Um, this is kind of a, a representation. So, you know, if, if the pyrophosphate is positive, uh, this is the, um, the Azenek published uh, criteria. And you can either diagnose it at one hour. If it's not diagnostic, you do a three hour approach, which we just discussed. All right, so now that we know the pathophysiology, the imaging, we'll just briefly touch uh, on the, uh, the current and emerging uh, therapies. So let's start with AL amyloid. So the most important thing is to work with hematologists as early as possible, okay? The, the free light chain business, you're, you're looking at a ratio, you know, normally the ratio is one to one. If the ratio is higher, it suggests there's a plasma cell dyscrasia. The problem is that a lot of these patients have kidney dysfunction, which will make the interpretation of these findings difficult. Your hematologist, in this case, is your best friend. You want to get them involved as early as possible uh, for you to understand these nuances, okay? Early diagnosis is key. The median survival of these patients without treatment is six months, okay? So there are two approaches. There's a cardiac direct, directed approach and there's a, a heme directed approach. These patients don't tolerate beta blockers because they, they have uh, uh, sort of these neuropathies, autonomic dysfunctions. Uh, even small doses of, of things like beta blockers and ACE inhibitors can really drop their blood pressure. And actually sometimes you have to give them midodrine. At any rate, um, um, so you give diuretics, salt restriction, et cetera. Then the heme-directed approach, which happens at the same time, uh, essentially, the, you know, I won't spend a lot of time in this, but the goal is to suppress the light chains, uh, 
there's chemotherapy or stem cell. Just so you know, there's only been one randomized trial that compared chemotherapy versus stem cell uh, transplant. It was done. Uh, it was done in France. It's published in 2007. Uh, they compared um, nephilim and dexamethasone to stem cells. That's an older type of chemo regimen. We don't even use it anymore. But even using older chemo regimen. Uh, the, that trial favored chemo. So we don't really use stem cell transplants that often. It's mostly chemo-based. And especially now, with the advent of newer chemo uh, regimens, uh, like the proteasome inhibitors, the bortezomibs, et cetera, um, you want to do that uh, uh, in, in, in favor of the, of the stem cell. This, the the regimen is called Cyborg-D uh, and is a current contemporary approach, all right? Just so you know about emerging therapy, that there is something called an anti-CD38, daratumumab. Anti so CD38 is expressed uh, on, a, on, a, on plasma cells. Uh, there's a trial that's published out of Stanford. Uh, they retrospectively looked at 24 patients who had filled multiple uh, um, lines of treatment um, for AL amyloid. Okay, they received uh, daratumumab uh, and steroid for a predefined cycle. Uh, 72 of the patients in the study had cardiac involvement. 76% of these patients achieved hematological response. So hematological response means either a complete response or a partial response. Of those, 36% achieved complete remission. This has subsequently led to a trial, the phase three trial called an Andromeda trial, uh, as investigating the use of, of this um, um, their tumumab as upfront uh, to cyborg D. So we don't know the results of that trial yet. And I will close up by just talking about ATTR. So there's been a lot of recent exciting um, sort of uh, trials regarding management, okay? So this is schematic representation of, of what we talked about in terms of the homotetramer. So the, the things that we want to do is twofold. One, we want to stabilize the homotetramer protein to keep it from disassociating into monomers and then subsequently aggregating into amyloid fibrils. We want to stabilize the homotetramer. There, there are two options. So difunazole is actually an NSAID. It's FDA approved for arthritis, but in 2013 in a trial, it actually was found to bind the same site as the feminists, and, and then it, it stabilized, stabilized it. The problem is that you don't want to give NSAIDs to patients who already have underlying renal dysfunction, and you don't want to give NSAIDs for extended period of time, period, right? Um, and then there's the feminist. So the feminist was originally studied in 2011, um, and it was it was uh, studied in Portugal. It was a trial out of Portugal, uh, and it involved multiple centers, several in Europe, several in South America, and actually, the, the feminist. So that that trial was a negative trial, but I just want to tell you guys something about about that trial, which is interesting. So those patients enrolled in a trial, okay. So the primary endpoint was responder or non-responder. Did you respond to the feminists or did you not respond to the feminists? Okay. The thing is, when they when they conducted the trial, they committed a class, classic clinical trial design error. All right. So the patients enrolled in that trial, a lot of them, okay, were on a transplant list, a liver transplant list, which at the time was sort of the standard classical way to treat. Okay. So the transplant list, and if they received a transplant during trial, they were deemed as non-responders, except for they were really non-responders. They just happened to be on a transplant list, and by sheer luck or the order of where they were on a transplant list, they got a transplant. So those patients had to be excluded, okay? Just, again, out of luck, it just happened that, so 26 patients were excluded, and it was very, very even, so 13 patients on each, on each arm, right? That decreased the power of the study. The p-value was 0 0.68, okay? There was a trend uh, for improvement in symptoms and other endpoints among the, the, the feminist group, uh, but because it, it decreased the power of the study and it couldn't get a statistically significant p-value, the FDA said no to the feminists, okay? However, the European body, I don't know what it's called, but they said okay to the feminists. So the feminists have been used in Europe since 2011, 2012, um, because of that trial. So the other, the other thing that, that the other strategy is TTR production uh, knockdown. So um, essentially, you want to give something that then prevents the translation of these proteins. 
Um, and then you can give a uh, RNA silencer, which is patisseran. Uh, you know, tisseran is an anti-sense, anti and it also uh, knocks down the production of uh, TTR. So uh, briefly, um, so this is the ATTRACT uh, trial. Uh, the ATTRACT trial is uh, looked at the feminists. They enrolled 441 patients across uh, multiple centers internationally. Uh, wild type and familial uh, patients were enrolled. The trial that I mentioned early in 2011 with the feminists, that was only patients who had FAP, so the, the V30 mutation. Uh, so these enrolled both, okay? The primary endpoints were all cause of mortality and CV hospitalization in the hierarchical fashion, fashion. And the secondary endpoints were change in quality of life and then six minute walk tests, all right? So what did we find? Well, it was pretty remarkable results, okay? So the, in terms of all-cause mortality, the number needed to treat 7.5, all right? And if you just look at these curves, so at about 18 months, the curves uh, start separating. So to feminists, uh, you can see improved mortality just at 18 months compared to placebo, all right? Uh, when we look at CV hospitalizations, Again, is also impressive. So basically, uh, you need to, to, uh, to prevent one hospitalization, you need to treat 4.5 people, which is impressive. And compared to other major trials in heart failure, this is, it, it, blows, it blows it out the water, all right? And it was, importantly, keep in mind, this is only done with 441 patients. All these other trials enrolled thousands of patients to get a, a, a p-value that was this was significant. So only 441 patients. Okay, so when we look at the secondary endpoints of quality of life and six minute walk tests, the thing that just strike you merely looking at this is how quickly this works. All right, so instead of waiting 18 months, for example, this happens immediately. You give to families, there's changes in six minute walk tests, there's changes in, in, in quality of life, and it happens instantaneously. All right, so that, that is the ATTRACT trial. There's another trial called the Apollo trial. Uh, this is published, I think it's actually published the same day in New England last year in 2018 as the, as the track trial. Uh, this is the, the, the drug they investigated is patisseran. It's a double-blinded uh, randomized control trial. It looked at patients with hereditary TTR. Uh, patisseran is an IV drug. It was given uh, Q3 weeks. Patients were randomized to patisseran or placebo, and they were followed up for 18 months. The, the primary endpoints is a change in modified neuropathy impairment score. So higher, higher scores indicate more impairment. Okay, the higher scores, more impairment. Secondary endpoint, there's uh, several of them, but uh, importantly, this questionnaire that, that also um, uh, sort of indicates uh, uh, quality of life and higher, higher scores, worse quality of life. So what, what does this show? So related, to, so as it pertains to the primary endpoint, so you see that in the patisserie group, okay, at 18 months, not only does it get, does it not get worse, it regresses. So patients, so they're, so patients not, are not just stable, they actually improve, neuropathy improves, you can regress the neuropathy, all right? Same thing for the secondary outcomes. The p-value was something to the order of, I don't know, 1.9 times 10 to the 24th or something of that nature, just incredible p-value, all right? So this is uh, the end of, of my talk, so I just want to summarize this, okay? So, so cardiac amyloid is a disease of protein misfolding and, um, and direct cardiac toxicity, so not just the, the aggregation leading to diastolic dysfunction. Diagnosis relies on attention to an entire range of clinical clues from symptomatology, physical exam findings, and imaging characteristics. Advances in CMR have made tissue characterization possible right, with late yellow enhancement and CMR parametric mapping. A positive PYP scan is diagnostic for ATTR and therefore obviates the need uh, for biopsy, which is more invasive, obviously. Um, and then there are new and emerging therapies for management, so no longer is this a death sentence, right? Um, and, and earlier diagnosis is important, so we can start these patients uh, early on medication um, and um, this has been borne out from single center studies as well as a large multi-center randomized control trial. Most importantly, if you haven't paid attention to anything related to my presentation, just remember one thing. When in doubt, call Dr. Bott, okay? Because I'm sure he'll, he'll know how to answer your question. Uh, so with that, thank you for listening, and I'll answer any questions.
Yeah, that was excellent, very comprehensive. I, I, just given the time, I don't have any questions, but if we have a couple quick questions, uh, we can take them now. Otherwise, uh, Marcelo will hang around for a few minutes. Only question I'll ask you, Marcelo. So what do we do with children of patients who have the mutation? So in Atlanta, we have a lot of patients with the V122i mutation. Yeah. Yeah. And then a 50-year-old patient, son of a patient who's dying of TTR amyloid, and the son who's 50 now has the mutation, at what point would you start them on therapy? Because this tefamidus costs $220,000 a year, yeah. and the diflunosol has not had a cardiomyopathy study that's extensive that we can sure. hang our hats on. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the answer is a bit nuanced, and, um, but short answer is we don't know. Okay, now the, the, the clinical answer is that um, it's important, A, to have a conversation early, okay, with these patients because sometimes, although they may not have sort of these uh, imaging manifestations of disease, they may develop symptoms rather early. We know that these patients with the uh, 1, 2, and 2 ILE mutations develop heart failure at a younger age than wild type, okay? So certainly identifying these patients early is important. Um, Though there are recent studies, um, which I didn't mention, uh, that have shown prognostic value of, of these imaging modalities with parametric mapping, et cetera, that maybe, so even, like I said, in patients who don't have like latent gadolinium enhancement but have some degree of fibrosis, perhaps using that to identify patients early uh, would be of value. But, but more studies on that need to be investigated, and we don't really know the answer to that yet. Yeah. So all I'll say is, Diagnosing these patients early is a effect, multi-generational effect. We could really help their children. And uh, as a center, we probably do one of the most um, TTR amyloid tra transplants in the country. In fact, we've done six in the last three years. So wow. find them early. We can help them. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.